Hello and welcome to the Rider Review. This is Eric Corrupt Rider, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 2008 movie titled Nights in Rodanthe. Nights in Rodanthe is a romantic drama that runs for an hour and 37 minutes long. It is directed by George C. Wolfe and the script was done by Ann Peacock and John Romano based on a novel by Nicholas Sparks. It is produced by Denise DeNovi. The score was done by Janine Tesori, the photography by Alfonso Beato, and the editing was done by Brian Cates, and it stars Richard Gere, Diane Lane, Christopher Maloney, Viola Davis, James Franco, Mae Whitman, Scott Glenn, Pablo Schreiber, and Charlie Tehan. Now the story goes a little something like this. Adrienne Willis, played by Diane, her life is one big muddled mess. She is staying in an isolated coastal village called Rodanthe, located in the outer banks of North Carolina. She is temporarily watching over the inn that is owned by her friend Jean, played by Viola Davis. Through all the calmness, she is indecisive as to whether she wants to return home to her philandering husband, Jack, played by Christopher Maloney, and a daughter named Amanda, played by Mae Whitman, who totally resents her. Or she can make the decision and just to make Rodanthe her permanent home as a way to just simply get away from it all. Her outlook on life changes once she gets acquainted by a surgeon named Dr. Paul Flanner, played by Richard Gere, who's in the midst of trying to reunite with his distant son, Mark, played by James Franco, who is doing medical practices in the South American country of Ecuador. So he also checks in t into the inn for the weekend. Now, in the Hollywood machines, it seems that the age demographics that get soundly neglected, especially in the romantic genres, are the, are the 30 up moviegoers. At first glance, I thought that Knights and Rodanthe would be a refreshing romantic drama that will appease to the adults who are roughly around my age group. It looked like it could have starred Betty Davis or Joan Crawford as they smoke like a chimney while engaging in a conversation saturated with cynical jokes with their lovers as we watch as their hearts are crumbling before our very eyes. Sadly, this film has more cheese to it than a slice of pizza. It's just one of those lagging dramas that probably may appeal to some but not to others and I'm not contradicting people who like this movie hey if you like these kind of movies if you like these emotional tear jerkers that pull your heartstrings well then the more power to you don't take my words for it but then there are people who are like me who just did not feel very well intrigued are enthralled by the whole movie as a whole. Now this brings now one of the, the the redeeming qualities about this movie is that this brings back Diane Lane and Richard Gere together since their last film, Unfaithful. In fact, this is the third collaboration that Diane Lane and Richard Gere had starred in. They starred in two other movies before that. Uh, back in the 80s they were in the Cotton Club and then of course there was Unfaithful and in 2008 this was their third meeting Knights and Rodanthe. So it actually shows that these two both seem very comfortable with each other. Well hey, they should. I mean they've been in two other movies before this one so why shouldn't they feel uncomfortable with each other? So we see Adrienne taking a sabbatical from her womanizing husband and her two children and watches over her friend's motel located in the 
isolated village of Rodanthe in North Carolina for the weekend and the only person staying there is a surgeon who's also in need of a hiatus but still doesn't want to be alienated from anyone else and the only reason why he's checking into the inn where Adrian is running is because he too has also a bit of a crisis that has manifested in him quite impactfully. You see, he is a surgeon and what was to be a simple procedure to one of his patients, his patient inadvertently died on him and her surviving husband is filing a lawsuit against him. Meanwhile his son has jumped ship and is doing and is getting away from his demanding father by practicing his medicine in the third world country of Ecuador. So he, what he wants to do is he wants to do his best to get over his grief over the loss of his patient while at the same time trying to reconcile his differences between himself and his estranged son. So when you put these two negatives together, it forms a positive. And I wish that I could say that I could relate to the situation and that I could understand what they're both going through. And, there, and yes, this is a movie that truly defines the terms misery deserves company. But there's also a lot about this movie that I cannot give full sympathy towards our two leading protagonists. We get the idea that a big storm is drawn near. That's because the weather reporter keeps repeatedly warns us and an old fisherman also warns us while Adrian is going shopping for groceries. But here is where the film really, really really drags me down it's because the situations that both Adrian and Dr. Flanner go through are illogical and I also feel that their romantic interludes seem at times very rushed very contrived and also it was also quite mushy at times so instead of doing a logical thing when a hurricane is on the horizon, like go to a nearby resort or a shelter for safety precautions, Adrian and Paul decide to stay on the island and the hotel which is like located right near the edge of the sea, you know, like with a major hurricane, it could easily float out like a pier. So while this is happening, while the storm warnings are still intact, what do they do? They get intoxicated, they hurl things, they exchange in small talk and get further acquainted. And then once the storm bears closer, they eventually wind up in bed with each other. I mean, I think that that doesn't really make sense at all. I mean, Paul and Adrian are total strangers. They don't know each other. I just find it illogical that they end up getting romantically linked. I mean, if it would have made sense if they would have spent some company time with each other, sure, because they're both, you know, in misery. By the way, there's another thing I didn't like about this movie. There were too many miserable characters. Even the supporting characters seem to come across as being dour and miserable. And that also includes, you know, Chris Maloney's Jack Willis, who even though is a philandering dick, he still, you know, wants to go back with Adrian. Even though 
he's cheating, even though he cheated on her. And the only reason why he wants to go back with Adrian was because the girl who he's been cheating with, well, she doesn't want anything to do with him either. So it's like, wow. First he goes with her, then he goes off with this woman, and now he wants to go back with Adrian. I mean, I wish she could have just told him to, you know, simply fuck off and let him go out on his own and look for somebody else. You had your chance, and you blew it. You blew, so fuck you. That's what I wish she would have said to him. You know, it's, it's, it's things like that that, you know, also, um, you know, another person who tears my heartstrings, who I also can relate to or could understand, was Scott Clem's character. I think his name was Robert Torlson, who is the husband of the lady who died in Dr. Flanner's office during a simple surgery. I could feel his emotional trauma but still at the same time most like I said most of the characters in this movie are very depressing this is a depressing movie so I think if I would recommend people who are suffering depression or battling depression I would simply simply recommend you not to watch this movie just for your own sake I'm not say, telling you I mean, I'm not like trying to tell you to stop you from seeing this, but I'm only just suggesting. I'm not demanding. I never demand a person to not see a movie. If you want to see it, you know, by all means. But if you are depressed, I only just recommend you keep away because your depression will only go from bad to worse. So it's just a precaution, that's all. So, the next day, uh, as the bright sun is shining upon them, Adrian wants Paul to come to terms as to explain why he's staying in this hotel. And he tells her that he's trying to face his demons before going on a voyage to Ecuador to be reunited with his distant son, Mark, who is played mostly a cameo performance by award-winning actor James Franco and uh, so eventually Adrian is now you know like is now going back I guess he went back to with Jack because and she tries to come to terms with her two children Paul eventually flies off to Ecuador to be reunited with his son the film ends uh, with a very, very sad note. Uh, he promised that, you know, he was going to come and visit her someday soon. But unfortunately, that day never came. Finally, his son, Dr. Mark Flanner, arrives at her door to give her the bad news. Unfortunately, in a mudslide, Dr. Flanner, Dr. Paul Flanner, sadly passes away, and he returns the letters that he gave her, including one last letter that he for, that he forgot to give her. And as she reads his letter, she goes down in tears. Okay, if that's not enough to make you depressed, I don't know what is. Now I know this sounds like a uh, insensitive rant on my behalf but here let me tell you something I have no personal ill feelings for Diane Lane she is a very talented actress and she is a very and she has a very pretty face for someone her age for a lady at 50 years old she really has aged gracefully and her performance in this movie is practically really the only good thing about this movie Overall, the stuffy direction by George C. Wolfe and the badly written script by Anne Peacock and John Romano 
based on the adaptation of Nicholas Sparks' novel, is what really ruined the movie. The uh, even though the photography was gorgeous, but the atmosphere was more claustrophobic, and this movie really makes you more depressed after seeing this movie. It's all formulaic, predictable, really not much going to it. To me, it's a mundane, featherweight melodrama saturated with tiresome cliches and pointless drivel that makes you stare at your watch contemplating the minutes to when it's going to be over. Which is quite shameful that we members of the 35 Up Club are given this material where the romantic leads are in the middle-aged club. Does Hollywood think that middle-aged people are boring and just pry upon boring things? To me, that's very insulting. And one more clip I have about Knights in Rodanthe. The poster of the man caressing Diane Lane is clearly not Richard Gere. Whoever he is is not very convincing. How gullible does the Hollywood industry think we are? Don't insult our intelligence. If I was to give this rating a scale out of 10, I would have to give this a 5. Well, I guess this ends my writer review. Uh, thank you all in for listening. Uh, if you want to subscribe to my channel, please feel free to do so. You can leave a comment. Remember, be kind, be courteous. And I will be back again with another movie review in later dates. So until next time, this is Eric Correct Rider saying, keep, take care of yourself, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Thank you.